Hi class, this is lesson 13, video 3, and commercial law, BA 3302, and I'm going to talk to you now about the duty of the buyer, The and, we're, and again, we're in, you know, the chapter is about performance and, and, uh, and remedies in the case of non-performance. What, what are the, what are the duties of the buyer in a, in a contract for a purchase, okay? And this is going to be a purchase of goods under the Uniform Commercial Code or the UCC. The buyer has three general duties, inspection, acceptance, and payment, okay? I mean, he needs to inspect the product, accept the product, and then pay for it, of course. But the buyer has no duty un unless and until the seller tenders delivery. So you got to deliver, obviously, or else the buyer doesn't have a duty. But once the seller tenders or provides delivery, uh, the first thing the buyer's got to do is inspect the, the goods. The buyer has a qualified right to inspect the goods, but there are some exceptions to the right to inspect. Um, a buyer might waive his right to expect, okay? That's the first thing. Parties may agree to uh, payment, that payment is required before inspection. They might agree about that in advance. So you got to pay and then inspect. If that's the case, the buyer must pay unless the goods are just so obviously non-conforming uh, that you can tell without really inspecting the goods well then you don't have to pay but payment before inspection does not count as acceptance so even if you've got it in your contract that you're going to pay and then you get the goods later or something like that so you end up inspecting the goods later just because you paid and and physically accepted the goods is not legal acceptance okay the buyer still has a right to inspect the goods and reject them if, if they turn out to be non-conforming in some way. The second thing under inspection is uh, there's no prior inspection if delivery is made uh, COD. If it's cash on delivery, so you've got to pay when the stuff is delivered right then, you don't have to inspect first. Just pay the man, let him be on his way, you're the delivery guy or whatever, but then you do your inspection. Uh, the next point, um, C, I guess, under inspection is there's no, no prior inspection required if delivery is made against documents of title. So if they're going to deliver and, 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 you know, the, it's the documents and the title documents, you don't have to inspect. Um, finally, if the buyer fails to inspect or he fails to discover a defect that inspection would have revealed, the buyer can't later revoke acceptance. If, if, if he failed to inspect but should have inspected but did but didn't and therefore doesn't find the defect if he finds a defect later when it was his fault for never inspecting well then he, he can't you know complain later and, and 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 try to revoke his acceptance okay but there are there are exceptions to then too for example if if the if an inspection would have not revealed the problem well then the fact that you didn't inspect doesn't really make any difference um okay the second duty of the buyer, I mentioned the first one is inspection. The second one is acceptance. There's three ways to accept goods. First one is words. After a reasonable time to inspect, whether the buyer inspects or not, if he had a reasonable time and then he says to the seller that the goods are fine, the goods conform, I'm going to keep the goods. There Maybe there's a non-conformity, but I'm keeping the goods anyway. Well, you can accept by words, obviously. The second way to accept is through silence. Uh, you had a re after the, after a reasonable time to inspect. Buyer never says anything, doesn't reject the goods. Well, then that becomes an acceptance because you had the goods. You certainly had time to inspect them, and you never said a word about it. Well, then that eventually is gonna that's gonna mature into acceptance by just by you keeping your mouth shut. So silence can be acceptance after after reasonable time for inspection. And then the third way to accept would be action. So you've got words. You can accept by words. You can accept by saying nothing. And then, of course, you can accept by action, which would be like where a buyer acts in a manner inconsistent with the seller's continued ownership. For example, the buyer begins using the goods. Well, then he, is, he, he accepted them. Or if the buyer sells the goods to someone else, well, then he obviously accepted the goods, okay? Okay, the third duty of the buyer, I told you inspection and acceptance. Uh, 
The third duty is payment, okay? The parties may specify in their contract what payment is, what payment means, and, and when payment has to be made. But if they don't specify all those terms, well, what happens? You guessed it, the UCC will jump in with gap filler terms like we've seen in several of the, of the, of the topics we've talked about recently. The Uniform Commercial Code, Article 2, covering the sale of goods, frequently uses gap filler terms to, to, to make a contract work as long as the one of the parties is a merchant and it's kind of like, you know, you know what they meant, the judge knows what they meant, everybody kind of understands what the intent was. Again, you can't use gap filler terms, uh, you can't use them against a, a, a naive uh, or unsophisticated party or whatever because someone like that, you know, if they're not in the business normally, well, you can't. But if it's merchant and merchant, you can use gap filler terms against a merchant who should have known. Okay, but back to this point, the payment, the, the parties may specify in the contract what payment means and when it's going to be made. If they don't specify, then the UCC will control. Um, let me read you a, a big old block here in, in uh, yellow. What I'm going to do, by the way, these notes are going to end up on YouTube because uh, I've actually, uh, my, my, the guy I always call the producer, Richard, who did all these videos and handled everything for me, has suddenly moved to, I don't know, Brownsville or somewhere. So without Richard's help and because the office is closed on the second floor there in the Shea Street building, I'm putting these videos directly on my own YouTube channel. And, and that means I don't have a guy like Richard that can put my pictures into my notes. So I'm going to send you the, 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 the pictures and graphs and charts and stuff. Uh, I'll put those on Blackboard separately or Canvas or whatever we're doing. Okay, but anyway, let me read you this. As we've been saying all along, the parties can spell out the terms of the contract, but if the parties fail to state the terms, the UCC will fill the gaps with gap filler terms, what I just talked about. By the way, a key point I have failed to mention is that this is only true because this is a commercial contract. The law allows gap filler terms dealing with, when dealing with sophisticated parties but the law would not allow this in a consumer contract, okay? Why not? Because it would not be fair to go around filling in terms for contracts uh, that will be enforced against a person who is uneducated or naive or not experienced or, like my mom, smart and sophisticated, but she's retired and it's been so many years since she had to buy a house or anything like that. Like, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right because she's not as sharp in that way as she used to be. Um, we don't want to use the Uniform Commercial Code to fill in the terms for contracts and enforce them against a person that is uneducated or naive or not experienced or unsophisticated. The law wants to facilitate business. We want to help businesses to do business. We want to make those contracts happen. And thus, the UCC supplies gap filler terms in order to make business deals happen, but the law wants to protect the innocent the naive or the inexperienced. So the law will not treat ordinary consumers in the same way. That's that's just my little speech on the way the UCC works with the gap filler terms. All right, the next point, we were talking there about acceptance, three ways to accept um, by words, by, uh, what did I say? Words, in, I'm sorry, the three duties of the buyer were ex inspection, acceptance, and payment. Now we're going to move to Rejection. How do you reject the goods? Okay. If the seller fails to make a perfect tender, the buyer can reject the goods. Okay. You must, the buyer must reject goods within a reasonable time after delivery. If the buyer is in possession of the goods but has rejected them, then the buyer must hold them with reasonable care. In other words, you better take care of the goods if you expect the seller to come and take them back. Okay. You have to use reasonable care. And you need to permit the seller to come back and get their goods or you take them back yourself. If the buyer is a merchant, he must follow instructions from the seller, whatever the seller says, for disposing of the goods. Uh, but if the buyer does not provide, I mean, if the seller whose goods have been rejected does not provide the buyer with some instructions, the buyer might or may be allowed to sell the goods on the seller's behalf. And, and if so, the buyer is entitled to a commission for his efforts. And then uh, finally, we'll talk here briefly for one minute about partial acceptance, okay? 
What if some of the goods are good and some of the goods are not good? A buyer may accept any commercial unit and reject the rest. Now, what's a commercial unit? A commercial unit is, quote, such a unit of goods as by commercial usage is a single whole for the purposes of sale. Okay, a commercial unit may be a single article or a single set of articles. It may be a quantity, okay, like a bale or a gross. You know what a gross is? It's kind of funny hearing that on, on Seinfeld. Kramer was talking about buying a gross of, um, you know, some crazy scheme. And, it, and he was going to buy a gross of something. Anyway, a gross is a dozen dozen or 144. It's 12 times 12, a dozen dozen. But anyway, so a gross might be a unit, and you could accept one of the grosses and not accept another of the gross grosses that was delivered to you because maybe this gross is non-conforming or it has paint on it or something. I don't know, whatever. But this other one is fine, so you accept it. A gross or a, a, a unit, I'm sorry, is whatever is treated in this business as a single whole. This sort of thing, obviously, would be really quite clear in the course of trade like if it's eggs well we know a carton is a unit right if it's hay it's a bale is a unit you know half a bale not a unit you can't partially accept like half of a bale of hay and you can't you can't accept half of a dozen eggs and, and tell them to take the other six that's not how we handle partial acceptance so a buyer can accept any commercial unit and reject all the other commercial units something like that a commercial unit, again, is such a unit of goods as by commercial usage, you know, in the industry, is a single whole for the purposes of sale. A single or a set or a quantity or a bale or a gross, etc. Okay, thank you.